just to continue a bit on um, what James did, uh, focusing more on the build system, also a bit uh, about unit tests and then wrapping up with deterministic builds. Uh, I'm Marco Falke. I also work at Chaincode Lab, Chain Code Labs in New York City. Um, the build system is based on auto tools, so it should just work anywhere where, where auto tools runs. You just type in auto, auto again, configure maybe some options, and then make that's it. Very recently, we added support for MSVC builds, uh, mostly for Windows developers to do native builds uh, and not having to switch between the Linux and Windows all the time. And then for our release builds, we use cross compilation, which is currently only supported on Ubuntu. Um, to look a bit um, about all the modules and targets that our build system supports. So James was talking about regions and then for the build system, they're called modules. Um, there are some basic modules like util, which take care of logging or just random number generation or crypto primitives, which provide hash functions. Um, so we have Bitcoin CLI, which is one build target to just um, provide an utility command line interface to speak with a Bitcoin server to ask for maybe the chain state, maybe mempool state, maybe wallet state. Um, so this one depends on, on the basic modules. We do have some libraries included directly in the sub, uh, as a subtree, mostly so either uh, for convenience, we include Univalley, which isn't commonly distributed on major um, distributions. So we include it for convenience. And then we also include the elliptic curve library and level DB because they are consensus critical. Then we also have uh, dependencies on just general system libraries, for example, OpenSSL, which we use only the random number generator, LibreWind, or we use Boost for advanced C++ uh, language features. Um, then another build target all the way on the left is LibBitcoin Consensus, which is some sort of um, long, long-term project. It was designed to provide just a library that takes care of all, all the consensus that's going on. And then you could, for example, um, have your node, and then for some reason consensus changes, maybe there's a soft fork, maybe there's a hard fork, then you only update your library and you're running the latest consensus, but you don't have to up, upgrade your whole um, company infrastructure on, uh, like, for example, you don't have to update your RPC interface, uh, et cetera. But right now, LibBitcoin consensus is really minimal. It cannot deal with any anything that is stateful. So it, it can do some stateless checks, um, such as prim, uh, simple transaction verification. Um, so we do have another target, Bitcoin TX, which is a utility to modify, um, create or modify transactions. And then finally, all the other targets, this list is, is not exhaustive. Um, all of them pretty much depend on, on everything, which is the Bitcoin D, the server, the daemon, that runs in the background or the Bitcoin QT, which is the GUI. And then finally, a ton of test binaries, which also depend on, on pretty much anything. Uh, a bit about testing. So I'm not going to explain testing in general. There, um, there are obvious advantages of testing, but for Bitcoin and core, the like most important reason uh, in my opinion is that we need to have some harness to check that consensus rules do not change accidentally. 
Um, and then the other advantage is such as the design feedback loop when you write a new feature, it uh, gives you some, some feedback or a hint how, how to um, document that. And then finally, the, the nice warm and fuzzy feeling when Travis is green. So Travis is the continuous integration we use on the GitHub project. But actually, um, when Travis is green, it's pretty much meaningless. I will explain later what it means. Um, so to jump into some testing issues, if you look at um, the coverage we currently have, currently we have pretty good line coverage and function coverage, which is greater than 80%, but then branch coverage is around 50%, and then path coverage, coverage I couldn't get a number on, but I assume it's something like 0%. Um, that is just because when you have a really large program, a lot of lines of code, a lot of branches, you can you can never get full path coverage, or it's almost impossible. So for example, look at this two-line um, program. Let's assume it's the only function. So you call this program once, then you have 100% function coverage, and you also have 100% line coverage. But for, for branch coverage, it depends on what you pass in for, for those booleans. You could um, run it once, then you have 50% branch coverage. And then for path coverage, it's even worse. You would have to, to run it four times to cover all of the um, possible paths where you run, let's say first you run A and then X, and then you could also run A and Y or B and X or B and Y. And then just adding another line to this program in the same fashion makes it eight paths and it's going up exponentially. And there's, it's impossible to test all of these cases. Um, so even if we had full coverage, Dijkstra said you can only ever uh, show the presence of bugs, you can never prove that there's no bug. So in, in addition to tests, we need some sort of um, like other tools or techniques to prevent accidental changes to, to the consensus behavior. Um, what we do is maybe be reluctant in general towards changes. So whenever there is something which seems unnecessary, just avoid it, avoid to make, make the change. If there is something that needs, uh, has some, uh, some clear motivation, it needs to go through some thorough review process. And ideally, these two, it's, it's, it's not really clear what thorough review means. It's not clear how many people should look at it. And then even if people looked at it and acknowledged the change, it's not clear when enough people looked at it and when no one found an issue, it doesn't mean there's no issue. Um, so in the long term, there should be hopefully a uh, um, formal verification tool that just generally works and then can uh, prove that the consensus rules at least didn't change. But this is mostly a research topic. There's, as far as I am aware, no practical tool to achieve this today. We do have some tools um, such as a scripted diff on the source code, which was contributed by Corey Fields. And basically, instead of making a huge change of all source files, you only provide the essential change in the form of a script and then you run this script and the script defines how the commit looks like. Or another way is uh, build for compare, which was contributed by Vladimir, which basically does an object dump before the change and then compiles 
the, the executables and then does an object dump after the changes. And you com can compare what changed in the ob object dump and then figure out how, how that affects, like if it was wanted, um, if maybe nothing changed, which is usually great. But then even if nothing changed, you can only be certain that nothing changed for that particular compiler version you used, uh, that particular architecture you run the compiler on. Um, so it's also not exhaustive. Um, to continue on this, on this thought, so what is helpful for somehow sometimes proving that a change didn't change the binaries too much is deterministic builds. Uh, there's a great website with all the information on it. Um, just to give one sentence of it, it deterministic builds provide an independently verifiable path from source code to binary co um, code. And to give just a really short advantages and a comparison. So let's um, take, for example, plain old builds. And you wanted to compare for build verification purposes. You, for plain old builds, there was no general um, way to do this. And you'd have to manually compare the disassembly. Whereas with deterministic builds, you could do this automatically and check for bitwise identity. For example, you could have a build server run the build script and then check if, let's say you want to compare um, how, how the uh, Ubuntu's um, PPA uh, packages um, when they are compiled, that they are compiled without additional like vectors. So you can you could run in addition to the Ubuntu build server farm, you could run your own farm, build all the packages, and then afterward check for identity, and then maybe even sign off on these changes. Have have your build server sign off if there is no difference. Um, or to to look at distribution, so with conventional builds, you could only meaningfully designed by the release maintainer or the release build server It's if it's some automated script. Um, whereas with deterministic builds, these can be designed by, by anyone and hopefully by any builder. So you could have, for example, this build server or you build it on your own laptop, you build it on your own machine and then compare, compare the results and then sign the result. And then if maybe some, some of your friends want to run Bitcoin Core, they do not want to just trust some random website on the internet that they provide the correct binaries, or maybe they don't want to trust the Ubuntu PPA or the Ubuntu build server that they compile the, the right Bitcoin code without any backdoors or issues. So then you could maybe ask some friends and if they signed the binaries, if they did these deterministic builds, signed them, you can download them from anywhere, compare them and then check the signatures. Or ideally you just go ahead and do all of the building yourself and then also compare with your friends. Um, to give some, some common issues we found with deterministic builds or reasons for unclean builds. The most common one is probably timestamps. Just when you run, run the compiler, it's going to embed the timestamp of the current system time somewhere in the executable. Uh, these are often easy to work around by just setting a, a constant timestamp. Other issues happen when the system you're building on has a different has different tools or different libraries to build. For example, Python two version, Python uh, version three, which has a, a different implement 
implementation of the dictionary and then sorts the keys in the dictionary in a different order. So suddenly some, some parts of the by, uh, resulting executable are differently sorted and you get the different result. Um, of course, different compiler versions will, re will result in non-deterministic builds because different compiler versions maybe they even uh, maybe they only embed the the version of the compiler somewhere in the executable and then it's going to differ in that way or they have some different behavior to optimize um, the code and then you get differently sized binaries or differently performing binaries which are also going to be uh, non-deterministic or some fun things like number of um, CPU cores you use to compile, um, which could happen, for example, if there are different modules and then one is going to finish earlier and it's going to be written earlier to disk or in some way is differently sorted and that yields a different executable. And pretty much awesome for tracking down issues um, is this tool called Diffuscope, which was originally written, I think, by the Debian um, folks who also work on deterministic builds. But you can install it, I think, on pretty much any Linux system, also Fedora. Um, it's uh, on the Python package manager, and you can install additional dependencies with your own package manager. I find it really helpful. Um, to give an overview of how our de deterministic builds look like today. Um, so to remind, it's this path from source code to binary code. Um, as input, you have digital source code and then of course, some sort of descriptor, how to run the build. Um, these need to be the exact same, of course, for all the builders. And then our GTM builds environment is currently Ubuntu 18.04. And anyone when can run it. And in the first step, it's going to produce the executables for all the architecture. So uh, for Windows, for the 2-bit, 64-bit, I think, Mac OS, and a ton of Linux architectures such as ARM uh, and a ton more. I think it takes on a single core to run this more than a day. And then we have another step. So Windows and Mac require that these, these binaries that you run on the system are somehow signed with a key that is also signed off by Windows or Mac in, uh, or Apple in some way. So what we do is do a second step, create some detached signatures that work on, on those operating systems, and then do another step, which is really quick, and it just combines these detached signatures with, with the binaries and then yields the, the final binaries for, for the Windows and Mac operating system. And then to wrap up just on some issues that we're currently working on or, or just give an overview of the progress. So I mentioned we use Ubuntu for, for the build environment, which isn't ideal. So we, I guess we can be pretty certain that there is probably no backdoor in Ubuntu because if there was, most people run Ubuntu and if they run a non-backdoored Bitcoin Core in Ubuntu. It's on a, on a backdoored Ubuntu. It's not really going to help. Um, but it would be great to just have a way to pin the compiler version to, to just some defined version. Because if Ubuntu were to change the compiler version of, of the the environment we are currently using, we can no longer easily reproduce all the builds that happened in the past because different compiler versions means different executables. 
And this indeed happened, I think, for Bitcoin Core 0.12 or something. Um, then another thing is where we do these detached signatures. Right now, it is done for each operating system by, by a single person. So there's some kind of um, like bottleneck. Would be nicer if it was distributed so the trust would be somehow spread out. Um, could be achieved with distributed RSA. Um, and then just have multiple maintainers sign off on, on the binaries. But what works um, already today is, of course, the or the intermediate BTN, uh, GTN build results um, are assigned by a lot of people that built them. They, all the signatures are put in a repository and everyone can and should compare them. That concludes my talk. Thank you.